Good evening and welcome to Gay Cable Network. Tonight we're preempting our usual programming to bring you a program produced by Gay Cable in conjunction with Professor Joseph Denny of the University of Cincinnati. It's called The Golden Years, and this focuses on gay life in Germany from the beginning of the century up through and including World War II. We'll return with our usual programming next week, and tonight, The Golden Years. When I graduated from school, I was amazed at the number of things they never taught us because they were afraid to talk about them. Now that I'm a professor, when I teach the history of the gay and lesbian community, I feel as though I'm setting a great wrong right. Before the Nazis came to power, Berlin was an intellectual center for all kinds of new ideas. It was the avant-garde of modern culture. It attracted the most dazzling scientific and artistic minds of the world, from the physics of Einstein to the music of Schoenberg and his 12-tone compositions. In theater, there were the cabarets and the plays of Bertolt Brecht. Germany's director, Fritz Lang, was a pioneer in what was then the new art of cinema. The Berliners created a whole new school of architecture known as the Bauhaus, which later became the basis for much of our modern architecture. In art, there were the painters Clay and Kandinsky, and there was a satirical painter, Gross. Berlin was a city known for its nightlife and for its toleration of all kinds of sexual expression. It was crazy, wild, artistic, and bohemian. And this flowering of German culture is called the Weimar period. It lasted until Hitler ended it, 1933. The famous gay writer Christopher Isherwood lived in Berlin at this time, and he described the city he lived in in his stories. By the way, some of the stories by Isherwood were later made into a Broadway musical called Cabaret, and the music you now hear comes from the film version of the musical Cabaret. In an interview, Isherwood said that homosexuality had come to be known as the Berlin Vice, and that it was a kind of specialty in Berlin, something which the city seemed to want to be known for. Paris had absolutely cornered the idea of girls, girls in every shape and form. They had to have a sort of new specialty. I mean, I think this was done quite unconsciously, but I think, I still believe that it has a certain social um, reality, that they sort of instinctively felt, well, we've got to offer something different to the tourists. And so, oh, we'd be perverse. That'd be a wonderful thing, we'll all be perverse. And anything was perverse that wasn't uh, sort of straight down the line. And that became their kind of stock in trade. And also you have to remember that this was a period of incredible poverty. When I think they said as much as three quarters of the population were suffering to some degree from mal malnutrition. And um, people really, uh, you know, had to face the fact of uh, selling themselves if only they could. In a word, Berlin used to be the gay capital of the world. And for the gay and lesbian community of this time, these were the golden years. In 1897, a gay doctor by the name of Magnus Hirschfeld started the world's first gay liberation organization. It was called the Scientific Humanitarian Committee. The Scientific Humanitarian Committee had three goals. Their first goal was to decriminalize homosexuality. This was to be done by abolishing paragraph 175 of the German legal code. Their second goal was to educate the public about homosexuality. And their third goal was to educate and interest homosexuals themselves in the struggle for their rights. Now this is particularly amazing when we stop to think that in the United States, our gay liberation organization only got organized in 1950, whereas the Berliners were doing this way back in 1897. Moreover, in 1899, 
the committee started their own magazine. This was called the Yearbook for Intersexuals. Intersexual was another word for homosexual at that time. And for the next 24 years, this magazine published a wide variety of articles, all on the subject of homosexuality. They published articles on the anthropological and literary side of homosexuality. They published scientific studies and polemical studies. The Scientific Humanitarian Committee also organized a speaker's forum where they went on regular tours and speaking engagements to educate the public about homosexuality. And they started the world's first gay rights petition. This gay rights petition was to be presented to the German Reichstag, which is the German parliament. More than 6,000 prominent people signed this petition. Among them, Hermann Hesse, the Nobel Prize winning novelist. Thomas Mann, another Nobel Prize winning novelist. Karl Kautsky and Edward Bernstein, famous politicians. Martin Buber, the philosopher. Rainer Maria Rilke, the famous German poet. The German government's Minister of Finance, Rudolf Hilferdink. And Albert Einstein. It also got the unsolicited backing from such international figures as Emile Zola and Leo Tolstoy. August Bebel, the famous socialist politician, was a major sponsor of the first gay rights bill. And he introduced it into the German parliament with the following words. The number of persons who are homosexual is so great and reaches so deeply into all social circles, from the lowest to the highest, that if the police dutifully did what they were supposed to do, the Prussian state would immediately be obliged to build two new prisons just to handle the number of violations in Berlin alone. It wasn't until 70 or 80 years later that we in the United States had a gay lobby which could introduce such a gay rights bill to our Congress. In the campaign drive for this gay rights petition, the committee sent out letters to every member of parliament they sent out a press packet to 2017 newspapers. They sent literature to 8,000 civil employees and to 8,000 judges. They sent letters to Catholic priests all over Germany asking them to take a stand on the issue of gay rights. Catholic gays also organized themselves into their own political caucus to struggle for their rights. Here we have a picture of one of the flyers from their conference, one of the first religious caucuses of gay people. In 1904, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee published a pamphlet for the general public. It was called, What People Should Know About the Third Sex. This pamphlet was to educate people about homosexuality. Notice how they called themselves the third sex, another reference to homosexuality at that time. In 1922, the petition finally had enough signatures and enough power to be presented to the German parliament. In 1929, it was okayed by the parliamentary committee and was ready for a vote. But then the stock market crashed, Germany was thrown into economic chaos, and gay rights got pushed on to the back burner. The women's movement was growing in Germany, and one of the leaders of the women's movement, Elena Stöcker, spoke out for lesbians and took a stand for gay rights. The support of the women's movement was important because in 1911 the government had tried to add lesbianism as a crime along with male homosexuality, but the government's attempt failed. This was the first time that the women's movement and the gay rights movement formed a coalition, something which we Americans did not accomplish until 60 years later. German cinema produced the world's first gay film, Anders als die anderen which means different from the others. It was a story which pleaded for gay rights and for tolerance. This was all the way back in 1919. German cinema also produced the world-famous film Pandora's Box in 1929, in which the lead character was portrayed as a lesbian. And the film Victor Victoria was first produced in Berlin in 1933. The American film of 1982 was just a remake of this film, which was produced years ago in Berlin. Nightlife in Berlin was in full swing, and by 1914, the city had about 40 gay bars. What I want to do now is take you through some of these gay bars, 
giving you actual photographs and drawings from this time. Berlin had become the world capital of gay literature. And in the 1920s, about 30 different periodicals for homosexuals were being published in Germany. Here's a picture of one of the first lesbian magazines. Sally Engler was the editor of a lesbian newspaper and also organized clubs where women could meet each other without being harassed by men. Protest meetings were called to demonstrate against the anti-gay law, paragraph 175. And at one of these, homosexual leaders declared, Homosexuals, you know what the reasons and motives of your opponents amount to? You know, too, that your leaders and advisors have for decades been tirelessly working to destroy prejudices, spread truth, and achieve justice for you. And these efforts have certainly not been without success. But in the long run, you must carry on the fight yourselves. In the final analysis, justice for you will be the fruit of your own efforts. The liberation of homosexuals can only be the work of homosexuals themselves. By 1922, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee had 25 branches throughout Germany. Their motto was justice through science. As part of this scientific research, Back in 1903, Magnus Hirschfeld undertook the first large-scale statistical inquiry about homosexuality. He sent out questionnaires to 8,700 people, and through his polling technique, he found that approximately 2.2% of them were homosexual. This number shocked people because it was so great. Of course, Hirschfeld's statistical methods were not entirely accurate. But it is significant that he did conduct such a large survey years before Dr. Kinsey of the United States made his famous survey of sexual preference 45 years later. In 1919, Magnus Hirschfeld founded the Institute for Sexual Science. In educating the world about homosexuality, the early gay pioneers realized that they also had to study the entire range of sexual experience both homosexual and heterosexual. So this institute became a research center and a repository for all kinds of biological, anthropological, statistical, and ethnological data about sex. It became a kind of a university of sexual science with regular classes on a variety of subjects. It was the forerunner of the famous American Kinsey Institute of Gender Studies. One of the world's first marriage counseling bureaus was opened here and it helped thousands of people. It was copied in other countries. All kinds of scientists, politicians, and international visitors came to the Institute. And everyone who came was shown a copy of the gay rights petition for them to sign if they wished. Then Dr. Hirschfeld, in counseling homosexuals, developed his own method of therapy. This he called adaptation therapy. It was based on the idea that one should adapt to and accept one's homosexuality rather than trying to change one's orientation. Dr. Hirschfeld wrote, Our first concern is to set the homosexual man or woman at ease. We shall explain that homosexuality is an innate drive, is not the patient's fault, and is not a misfortune. Many people do not consider homosexuality a tragedy. 
And homosexuality alone does not stop one from becoming an able human being and a socially useful citizen, even though it may be difficult to do this in today's society. In order to free the patient from the torturing feeling of loneliness, we shall give him or her examples of homosexuals from the past and the present. We advise them to give up the depressing attempts at marriage and relations with the opposite sex. Such attempts are inconsiderate of one's marriage partner and can only worsen one's own situation. It is therapeutic to suggest to the patient two valuable activities, reading worthwhile books and making contact with homosexuals of high intellectual caliber. It is also valuable to have the patient meet mentally and intellectually adjusted homosexuals who have come to accept themselves. I once had an American patient who had lost all joy in living. He had severe headaches, could not sleep, and could hardly work. But on the day he decided to admit to himself his homosexuality, all of his ailments disappeared at once. Before, he'd been so despondent and irritable. Now, he radiated well-being. He could sleep and he could work better than ever. Again and again, we meet the special problems of the homosexual patient. One wants to know if he should emigrate to another country. Another wants to know if he should tell his family. Another has fallen in love with someone who is not interested. And another patient is in the army and needs to know if he should change jobs. I consider it a big step forward if homosexuals tell their relatives about themselves. Lesbians generally are more reluctant to do so. But even if the mother and siblings are pained, even if the father is afraid, it is still far better to be open about it. If we summarize what we have discovered about the treatment of male and female homosexuality, then we must conclude that genuine homosexuality cannot be cured through any kind of surgery, medication, or psychotherapy. The doctor cannot treat homosexuality, but he can treat the homosexual patient. And in doing so, he will find the adaptation theory we have just described will be of considerable help. Indeed, Dr. Hirschfeld's adaptation therapy would have been considerable help to American psychiatrists. But American psychologists and psychiatrists did not adopt his technique until 1972. In the Homosexual Yearbook for 1901, a lesbian writes an autobiographical essay. She talks about her professional success, of the good fortune she had in finding her lover. And she ends her essay with the following words. Defy this world and they will tolerate you. They will acknowledge you and they will even envy you. Raise the weapons. You must and will succeed. I've done it. Why shouldn't you all? Every single one of you succeed. In 1928, a newspaper, Völkische Beobachter, declared in its lead article that homosexuals should not be allowed to speak in schools. The headline of this newspaper reads, The Destruction of Youth. German Mothers, Do You Want to Hand Your Children Over to Homosexuals? The editor of that newspaper was Adolf Hitler, and this was the beginning of the end. The Nazis had always declared themselves to be anti-gay. Nazi propaganda said, homosexuality is the mark of Cain, the mark of a godless and soulless culture which is sick to the core. Only days after Hitler took power in March 1933, the Nazis had the police close the gay bars in Berlin. Then on May 6th, 1933, they announced that the city's libraries would be cleansed of books which they considered un-German. And they would begin with Dr. Hirschfeld's Institute of Sexual Science. At 9.30 in the morning, some trucks drew up in front of the Institute with about 100 brown-shirted students and a brass band. They drew up in military formation in front of the Institute. 
Then they marched into the building with the band playing. They broke through the doors. They emptied ink bottles over manuscripts and carpets and took away whatever they thought was objectionable. They searched every room and took down to trucks, basket after basket of valuable books and manuscripts, two truckloads in all. They tore Sigmund Freud's photograph off the wall, calling him that Jew pig Freud. They carried off the works of Oscar Wilde, Edward Carpenter, Norman Hare. They searched for the works of Judge Lindsay, the American juvenile judge, Margaret Sanger, the works of André Gide, Marcel Proust, Pierre Loti, Neil Zola, and others. A few days later, they took all of the books and photographs, together with a large number of other works, and publicly burned them in Berlin's Opera Square. More than 10,000 volumes from the Institute's special library were destroyed. They carried a bust of Magnus Hirschfeld in a torchlight's procession and threw it into the fire. One of the leaders of these brown-shirted stormtroopers was Ernst Röhm. Röhm was openly homosexual and considered to be one of Hitler's close allies. On June 28, 1934, Hitler turned against Röhm and had him murdered. Hitler then ordered the death of 300 other men who were associated with Röhm. He then issued a stern command to remove all homosexuals from Nazi party organizations. This event was called the Night of Long Knives, and it marks the beginning of the Nazi extermination of homosexuals. The Nazis had said, the German people can live only if it can fight, for life means fighting, and it can fight only if it maintains its masculinity. Therefore, we reject you. Anyone who even thinks of homosexual love is our enemy. Then one year later, in honor of the first anniversary of this purge of gay people, Hitler revised the legal code. He made any kind of erotic contact between males, such as kissing, hugging, or even a lewd glance, a felony. Even a homosexual fantasy was now against the law. What this meant was, if a person would to confess to his doctor or psychiatrist or a good friend that he occasionally thought about homosexuality, he could be arrested for this. Homosexuals by the tens of thousands were sent to concentration camps where they were subjected to special abuse. Most of them perished. The Nazis also took homosexuals from other countries which they had occupied and sent them to concentration camps in Germany and Austria as well. The insignia for homosexuals was a pink triangle, about two and three quarters of an inch in height, worn on the left side of the jacket and on the right leg of the trousers. In February of 1942, they again changed the law. Now any man found engaging in homosexual acts was to be immediately put to death. It cannot be established how many homosexuals died during the Third Reich. One official Gestapo figure says that between 1936 and 1941, approximately 41,000 men were convicted for homosexual felonies. Most gays were put in the western camps, such as Dachau, Buchenwald, and Mauthausen. The men with pink triangles were usually sent to level three slave labor camps, where almost no one left alive. But government figures do not tell the whole story. Many gay men were sent to camp without a trial, so we have no records of them. And in the military, which came to include almost all German men, you were quite often shot on the spot without a trial or any record of it. And many gays also perished unrecorded under the torture of their jail cellars, where they died of starvation and beating in the camps. The Nazis threw Europe back into the Middle Ages when gay people were put to death, when they were burned at the stake. Today, outside of one of the concentration camp sites in Austria, there stands a monument. And on that monument are the words to the homosexual victims of Nazism. They were murdered and they were silenced. It's interesting to note 
that when American soldiers opened the doors of the concentration camps and set the prisoners free, some American officers thought that gay people should be in those prisons, thought that gay people should be in the camps. This was because at that time Americans still thought of homosexuality as a sin, as an illness, as a crime. But that was soon to change. There was a gay man in the United States by the name of Rudy Gernrich, and he had barely escaped the Holocaust. He was a Jew from Austria, and he and his mother left Austria only days before Hitler's tanks rolled in. He settled in America, and in 1950, he met an American by the name of Henry Hay. Henry Hay wanted to start an organization in the United States which would protect gay people politically, which would organize gay people politically in the struggle for our rights. This organization came to be called the Mattachine Society. It was America's first gay liberation organization, and Rudy Gernrich was its first member. I think of Magnus Hirschfeld back in 1919. At the premiere showing of the world's first gay film, he stood before the audience, and he said that despite everything that had happened, I still believe in a world where knowledge will triumph over ignorance, where love will win a victory over hatred. We are here and we're not going away. We are here growing stronger the gay and lesbian community of the United States has won back many of the victories which we lost in Germany during the Holocaust. We now have national lobbies which fight for our rights. We have openly gay congresspeople on the state and in the federal level. We have a gay civil rights bill before Congress with many co-signers. Today there are so many gay and lesbian organizations in the United States that we cannot even begin to count them all. But all of us join together every year in June to celebrate gay pride and tell the world that we are here and we are here to stay. Now is the time, the moments at hand. Sisters and brothers, we must take a stand. Despair and doubt Free to choose in coming out And we
have a few moments left in our program this evening in which we can talk to Joe Denny. Joe, why did you do this film? Uh, I started this film at University of Michigan in 1982, 83, and 84. I taught courses there on gay history, gay and lesbian literature. And what I found was that I needed to create some sort of visual uh, teaching, teaching aids to help my students understand what was happening. It was a wonderful course, by the way. I had 40 students in it. About a third of them professed to be heterosexual, a third of them claimed to be gay, and a third of them said they didn't know. Uh, it was a really mixed group, and it was a wonderful experience for me, and I think for them, too. And what was the name of the course? Well, I taught a couple of them. I taught a course in gay and lesbian literature and another course in the history of the gay and lesbian community. And were they on the gay and lesbian community of the world or specifically on Germany? I, we did bits of everything. I tried to... St I started with Germany and then I went to the United States. I didn't go all the way back to classical Greece or anything like that. In this presentation, you suggest that if it hadn't been for a depression and the fact that Hitler came to power, a gay rights bill may have gone through the German parliament. Yeah, I think that's a distinct possibility. Typically, uh, well, not just the Germans, but any group that wants to pass a petition waits until they're certain that, certain that they have enough strength in the parliament or Congress before they present it to that parliament or Congress. Mm -hmm. So what happened here was they figured that they could probably get it passed, and then at the last moment the Depression came and the bill got pushed onto the back burner. Now that's been the history of our movement, the gay and lesbian community, anytime we try to make some sort of legislative change. Because we're the last item on every politician's agenda, almost any kind of issue can preempt are coming before a debate or coming before a Congress. So are you saying that if we were to struggle to get a bill through Congress, just the way time travels, chances are something will come along before we were actually able to get it through? That's very likely, yes. But that shouldn't keep us from trying. <laughs> Do you think it had popular support in Germany? It's hard to say, really. Uh, because the gay rights petition rested at the Institute for Sexual Science, the intellectuals and scientists and famous politicians who came to that institute, of course, all had an opportunity to see it and sign it. Likewise, anyone who came to the institute for help, ordinary people who came there for marriage counseling, a lot of people who came there to find out more about sex or their own problems, a lot of gay people came there, would see the petition and sign it. In that sense, it got popular support. On the other hand, they were not able to take it around to shopping malls as we are today and have people sign it or knock on people's doors through volunteers going door to door and have people sign it. The Institute did do seminars and did a lot to try to raise people's consciousness. It's interesting to note the petition was, I think, uh, 22 years in gathering petition, gathering names, gathering signatures. Times moved very slowly then. Likewise, attempts to give the petition strength took a long time. Where would they actually have these seminars? A lot of those seminars, uh, I don't know, actually, come to think of it, I don't know. Not to get morbid, but in the concentration camps, were the gay prisoners reserved certain tortures that were done especially for them? We have several sources of information on what actually happened in the concentration camps. One very good source is a book by a German, Heinz Heger, called The Men with the Pink Triangle. Heinz Heger was a gay man who went through the concentration camps and survived them. Uh, likewise, for an American reader, by the way, there's a famous play called Bent by Martin Sherman, which was produced in the 1970s. Both those works give an American experience of what it was like in a concentration camp. As far as we can tell, gay prisoners in concentration camps were the victims of the homophobia, both of the guards and of the other prisoners. And in that sense, they were victims of daily fag bashing. You talk about men, but we don't really hear much about women in the concentration camps. What do we know about them? Good question. Uh, women, on the one hand, uh, were not the victims of special laws against homosexuality. That is, there were no laws specifically against lesbianism. On the other hand, women had other kinds of problems in Nazi Germany. For one thing, in the Nazi philosophy, women only had three areas of activity, children, the church, and the kitchen. A woman wasn't allowed to stray outside of those areas of activity. Nazis believed in a firm separation of gender roles, and they were very firmly sexist in that way. In fact, the Nazis justify their own homophobia because of their own sexism. They say that homosexuality leads to a breakdown in the gender roles, that homosexuality would uh, make men less masculine and therefore less able to fight and join in militaristic adventures. It would, uh, a lesbian lifestyle would 
release a woman from the church, from the kitchen, from the children, and uh, they didn't want that either. They were very concerned about keeping women married and under the domination of a man, and they saw homosexuality as something which would fight against that kind of system. In a sense, then, their homophobia comes from their sexism. So it sounds like the, a breakdown of traditional family values as the Nazi party saw it. Yes, I think that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. It's interesting, by the way, to note the Nazis uh, formed an office to fight against homosexuality, and it was called the Federal Office to Fight Against Abortion and Homosexuality. The Nazis linked those two struggles together. Now, after World War II, it's interesting, your narrative seems to go over to the United States rather than keeping with Berlin. Why did the gay movement seem to transfer to the United States, or, or did it? Well, what happened was, yes, after World War II, there weren't very many gay institutions left in Nazi Germany. And indeed, when the Americans came in and set up a new government in Germany, they were not very interested in allowing gay institutions to flourish. Of course, they left Hitler's anti-gay laws on the books. And those laws were not removed from the German constitution until the 1960s. Uh, and yet there, were, there weren't any gay institutions here in the United States either at the time, were there? That's true. Although, uh, right after the war, we got started. It's almost, in the United States, our history is uh, a particularly severe repression against the gay community began right after World War II during the McCarthy period in the United States. And as a reaction against that oppression that we suffered in America, we started our first gay movements. We started the Mattachine Society, and eventually we started Stonewall uh, mm -hmm. and the Stonewall Riots. How would you compare Stonewall in 1969 and throughout the 70s to that time which you call uh, the golden years? The there are similarities and there's differences. Uh, yes, they seem to be on the surface very, very similar. Uh, the golden years in Germany was a time of great experimentation. Uh, it was a time when a lot of former traditional values were breaking down and people were happy about that and willing to experiment with it. Uh, and that seemed to be going on in the 1960s and 1970s in the United States as well. On the other hand, Germany was a period of, Germany at that time was a tremendously poor country. People were desperate. Uh, America was a very wealthy country in the 60s and 70s. But for a gay person looking back on history, yes, we see a lot of similarities. And sometimes Americans find this frightening when they look at the, what happened in Nazi Germany and what they see happening in the United States with our gay community. I think we have to remember though that those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Well, we know what happened now in Nazi Germany, and we can't let that happen here. And I don't think we will. I think we know too much, and we've come too far. You mean the American people or the gay population? The gay population. We used to be called the love that dare not speak its name. And now we're a political movement that can't be silenced and that won't shut up. Do you think uh, there's any chance that as things are going now, as, we, as we're going into a more conservative time, that things will go back in spite of what the gay community wants because we are only 10%. We are a minority. Right. I have a couple of thoughts about that. I would hope certainly that it won't happen, and my personal belief is that it would not happen simply because we would fight too hard to prevent it from happening. When I look uh, in the era of AIDS, for example, I don't see a whole lot of anti-gay legislation being passed. In fact, we've made a few milestones. New York, for example, one of the city's hardest hit by AIDS, in the midst of the AIDS crisis, passed their first anti-discrimination bill for gay people, something they couldn't get past in all of the 10 preceding years. Well, how have your audiences reacted to the golden years? It's been interesting. Uh, the entire subject of gay people during the Holocaust is a very touchy issue for many audiences. Many audiences see the Holocaust as something very special, something which belongs to them and only them. For example, Jewish audiences uh, see the Holocaust as something very special to their experience. And if they happen to be anti-gay or homophobic, they're very upset to find out that gay people shared and allowed the misery and the tragedy of the Holocaust. Uh, and they feel that de defies their memories. That's what happened, by the way, when Martin Sherman's play Bent premiered in Broadway. Uh, audiences were very uh, upset with the play and maybe enthralled with the play, too. It was highly controversial going to see this play and learning for the first time how gay people suffered under the Holocaust. The problem is that, the problem is that Many Americans were taught that Nazis were homosexuals. They were taught that, uh, wrongly, quite wrongly, that the Nazi party was a den of homosexuals and that homosexuality and Nazism go together. 
and to see this kind of presentation or to learn this much history totally turns upside down the world as they've always seen it up till now. You've shown this presentation to non-gay audiences too. Yes. How have they reacted? One thing I think that helps is I attempt to be as even-handed as I can. I don't do something, for example, to say, I don't try to say that any one group, uh, gay people or Jews or gypsies or Communist Party members, any one group suffered more than another group at the hands of the Nazis or suffered more in the Holocaust. I think that would be a terrible thing to do to try to compare sufferings when millions of people are dying. Uh, we can just say this is a great tragedy for all human beings. Joe, it's a pleasure having you come in this evening. Thanks. And thank you. And it was a wonderful program. Next week, we'll return with our usual programming. For Gay Cable Network, this is Mike Lehman. Have a good week. Good night.